Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. today to have uh, Judy Kay visiting from the University of Sydney. Um, I've known Judy for a bunch of years now uh, from the user modeling community. It's a great community of people interested in uh, building and applying models that, that uh, uh, forecast and predict and understand uh, user intentions and adapt interfaces and content uh, based on those kinds of inferences, among other topics. Um, uh, Judy has become known as somebody who's passionate about um, uh, user modeling and, and adaptive models, but at the same time has highlighted a very important uh, issue, which is making uh, those models scrutable and, and clear and controllable. Uh, and that's, I think we're, we agree that that's where the promise of building systems that are smart and intelligent, yet that people like and use uh, and understand at the same time, uh, and therefore can actually gain from that intelligence uh, versus, be, versus it being an impedance mismatch with reality uh, and a figment of the imagination of researchers versus uh, something that really delivers value in the world. Um, Judy is, is a principal of what she pronounces as CHAI, um, uh, the Computer Human Adaptive Interaction Group, um, which does um, basic and, and applied research and personalization and in ubiqu ubiquitous computing applications. Um, uh, she has been, uh, she, she's on several editorial boards and why I work with her on the editorial board of the User Modeling and User Adaptive Interaction Journal. Um, and uh, I guess you're on your way to WIST right now too. So you know, she's stopping off in Seattle, which I'm honored that you made this stop. So Judy, come on up. Okay. Okay. Um, and actually we had some discussion about the name of our lab, which was originally meant to sound the same as Kai. And I realize we've been user adapted because everybody else called it chai, and so we've started calling us chai like the tea. Yeah, so, okay. So I want to start with um, some things that I perceive as coming up a lot in the literature and in the public press and in the way things are going. And it's partly, of course, because of my blinkered view of the world but partly, I think, to support the stuff I'm going to explain that we're doing today. So some visions and trends, and where are we heading, perhaps, into deep water. And one of the places that I looked and thought you guys had uh, a lot of interest in was a 2020 vision statement from Microsoft. And reading extremely selectively from it, it said things like this, increase individual productivity and capability through cognitive assistance. And that's one of the things our group would like to do, partly because we all aspire to be really old one day and maybe we'll need that cognitive assistance, but partly because it's a worthy thing. Lifelong expert partners for every day in business, something that I've been wanting for a long time, personal assistant or three or four, and I can't afford them, so machines are hopeful. This one that's related to the first enables seniors to live independently longer, augmenting memory and monitoring capabilities. And that's a hard one for a whole lot of reasons. Complementing capabilities of physically and mentally challenged, which might actually be really similar to the ones above it. And another one that's my passion that I won't be focusing so much on today is lifelong one-on-one -on -one learning, which is the vision of the intelligent tutoring systems, AI ed research communities, which is where I actually started but have been drifting into slightly different waters. So here are some trends. Life caching. There are hints that, and here's a definition, collecting, storing, displays in your entire life, perhaps just for your own use, but amazingly people put a lot of this stuff on the web. I find it faintly amazing that anyone could be that confident that they're willing for the world to know, but that's what some people are doing. And this is one trend. We know that storage is getting cheaper and cheaper. We'll be able to keep a huge amount of data about ourselves. I already have boxes and boxes of data about myself that I don't know what to do with. But this is going to be digital, so the promise is much greater. Another which is the whole notion of collecting healthware and stuff that monitors you. And here's an example that we found on the web that's particularly bizarre. So here's one that shows what some particularly neurotic parent might do monitoring their child's sleep, 
You can see all sorts of frightening headings there, which um, diapers, bottles, solids, nursing, pumping, and medicine. Um, so just the notion that people probably actually want to measure a whole lot of stuff and keep a whole lot of this sort of data about their children. And now we have health involved for that. <laughs> right. So it's clearly a trend. Another related one is this notion of personomies. And here's a definition of a personomy that every person has a digital reflection, a shadow of bits and bytes leaving one's mark everywhere on the web, well at least wherever the web is. And here is a thing called ZoomInfo, which was one of these many applications that crawls the web and does what the website says is terribly clever natural language analysis, so I'll believe them and tries to find out stuff about people. Now, you can go in and doctor it yourself, and it may just be that Bill Gates has been doctored. But, um, and I don't know if this is correct, but it says that he's chairman of Microsoft Corporation and uh, founder, and he was a student at Harvard University, and so on. That last one is uh, his father, actually. Ah, so the last one's his father. Oh, well, there's some evidence then that it was um, probably done automatically. Um, you will note there are quite a lot of references it found that it analysed over, and obviously some are his dad. Then there's another page which more, has more about him, Wikipedia entry, um, and so on. This is just another example of the stuff that's available that can be amalgamated in a way to get a picture of you. In fact, I personally used this when I had to do some grudge admin work, and I'd forgotten all the committees I was on, <laughs> and it hadn't. Another slightly different dimension is the ability to go up to any computer and personalise it. I hope you'll appreciate the American spelling for your benefit. And um, have it do the stuff you want. So maybe I carry something with me so that it's all set up. It's so irritating to go from machine to machine and have them all kind of different. And so that's one direction. But just to temper that, this comment from Jeff Raskin that right now some people feel that they're oppressed. So I'll give you an example of that. Some time ago, I went to the New York Times and it said I had to register. And what I found interesting is a trend that I'm starting to see where not only does it give you the usual request for a member ID and password and so on, but it then says, alongside the secret question, what is this? Because it seems to me people are starting to demand scrutability. They're starting to demand to know why things are there and why do we need this for the email address. And in fact, if you click on that, it takes you into this uh, information that was always there in their privacy policy, but the point is it's put a link right there. And to me that's a sign that we've got people wanting to know why things work the way they do. So the themes that I hope that I've indicated by these examples are there is lots of public data about us, particularly on the web, but in general there's heaps of stuff about us. And yet in a way it's not very accessible to me, my data in particular. There's lots of other public electronic trace data, and some of that, for example, is all the websites that um, have left cookies with my browsers and that are amalgamating stuff about me. And on the one hand, of course, I, I could do stuff to control that in varying degrees. But what I'm really concerned about is that I don't actually have much use of that. I can't access that data. There's personal data about me in most privacy legislation, but I can't use it. Generally, the notion that there are data silos all over the place about people, all my school records, all my medical records, even the stuff on all different machines, and uh, my own private stores as well. So there's all this stuff about me, and I can't really make much use of it. And this notion of lifelong uh, user models is something that aims to get past that. And finally, the thing that really underpins the work we've done, and that is that people are concerned about privacy and control. Maybe they aren't as controlled as they say, concerned as they say they are when you ask them face to face. Maybe we'll all get used to it. Maybe I'll get used to the fact that I'm being recorded here and I won't be quite so self-conscious. Uh, maybe I need to do 200 hours of this before that happens. But the, the issues are certainly of some importance. So the next thing I want to introduce is this notion of scrutability, which as I often say is an English word, not quite an ordinary English word. So what I mean by scrutability in relation to this control and understandability is that you can understand it if you exert some effort. It's comprehensible. 
and the next one is understandable upon close examination. So the, the thing I want to make clear, and I will concede that you can see it's um, under the difficult words section of this dictionary, so it's not exactly an ordinary word. It's a word we do use in the opposite sense of inscrutability quite often. We talk about things as being inscrutable if you can't understand them. And people are inscrutable. I have no idea what you guys are thinking. You're probably planning your dinner tonight or whatever. And people are meant to be inscrutable because that's just the way we are. But I believe very deeply that computer systems should be built, especially if we're going to make them personalized so that they're scrutable. But I want to emphasize this notion. I'd rather have used a word everybody uses, like transparent or whatever, that's in normal English. But the reason I don't want to do that is transparent. You know, if something's transparent, I can't help but see it. And I don't think that's the issue. I think that when I'm sitting using a computer to do a job, I want to focus on that job. But at the time that I decide that I want to know why it did something or what's going on in the personalization, I think I have to exert effort. It has to be that I'm scrutinizing it and, you know, the notion of it. So unfortunately, it's a word that really captures what I mean and it is an existing word, so it's reasonable. When would it be beneficial to have something be transparent without scrutinizing So when would it be useful to be transparent without scrutinizing it? I think that's a hard question. Um, maybe I'll come to some of those answers. I'll try and integrate it into the rest. Certainly, certainly, uh, revelation based on effort makes things more transparent. When we see all the machinery, we don't really care about it. Uh, and if you care, you can put the effort in and see and have revelation. But some things you might want to just have to be transparent to begin with. Okay, I agree. Um, this notion that some things you do want to have to exert the effort and some things right. you don't. I won't be talking today about a system that actually did a lot of work on just that issue. So I'll digress just for a minute. Um, I will actually point out that I was haggled down by uh, my advisors in the lab that we should only have four of our systems demoed. We're a small lab, but we do lots of different things. So the digression I will take is I'll say we built a system that did web personalization. And we put a link on the bottom that said, how was this personalized to me? And we thought that would be fine. We thought that people would just click on that when they needed to. So we purposely set up some experiments where we gave rubbish to people. We said, do you want jokes interspersed with the information? And if they said no, we gave them jokes. And you know, we asked some other questions like that. We purposely did the wrong things. Did they scrutinize? No. Could they find the link? No. Even if we really pushed the link at them, they, they didn't. Even we gave them a tutorial beforehand, and we knew they knew how to use that interface. Once they got engaged in the task, they didn't scrutinize. And what we found out in the end was, um, we actually had to put it right on the screen. You got your personalized content on one side and then the other side you got a summary of all the personalization there and then people could find it. So I think at least two answers to the question about when you want the personalization transparent are one when people don't even have the mental model to think to look for it which is why I think they didn't click the link that said how was this personalized. We had to put it in their face otherwise they wouldn't have thought to look. And the other is if you can do it in a lightweight way or it's important or whatever. Okay, so going back to step one of four that I'm going to present, this is a system that in Eric's mail he suggested he was interested in because we showed some of it at user modeling earlier this year. And this is a system we call Locator down the bottom. It's really one of several demonstrators for our user modeling which we built a whole lot of software based on an approach which is driven by this idea of scrutability. And we had previously used it in a number of ways, but we've now been pushing it into Ubicom. And in fact, we made, a, Bob Comerfeld actually, made the interesting observation that what we had used as a representation for modeling beliefs about people could be used to model other entities in the environment, the sensors, devices, places. And so I'll show you that. And so one of the demonstrators which makes it more concrete is our locator interface. Now this is an anonymized version of part of it. I could actually log on later and show you the real thing. Obviously this is personal information because it says where people are and when they were last seen. And um, I'll just go quickly through it. I guess I'll go over to it. So this is a schematic of our floor of the building level. Oh sorry, it's not. That's level two. Okay. So it's level two of our building. And um, we have a little dot to represent each person and the color 
the same colour dot appears on the map. And uh, there's quite a large number of names there and the colours are a little hard to see, but down here is a complete list. So it says John is in room 324 and um, you've seen two minutes ago. You can click here to get an explanation of how the system concluded that, which lets you see the evidence used. So it's a fairly simple locator, evidence, locator system and we've now had it running for over a year in our lab and you can only use it if you subscribe and if we're willing to take you. And uh, you subscribe by taking any Bluetooth enabled device and registering it with the system. We then start building models of that device. And you can also download an activity sensor on your computer, which will, again, obviously you want to choose to do that. We, then we start modeling your activity on your computer. And all we model is whether you're using the keyboard or the mouse. Nothing else at the moment is sent back. And so we figure that if, for example, uh, your computer in your office is being used, then that's you in our system. We also have a few other sensors, but I'll come to them later. They haven't really been used for the full year. So what's quite interesting is we've now had this in use and we've been able to ask ourselves how do people use it. Now it's not exactly rocket science to do something like this, but it was a quite nice demonstrator that all the stuff we built worked because it has worked quite nicely for quite a long time. So I hope I've explained it clearly enough. What does the Bluetooth feel like? uh, we have... Do you have like sensors in the... Okay, so we have a bunch of sensors around the building, only a fairly small number. And they, um, okay, so the sensors detect any Bluetooth device. They then send that to, as it happens, an Elven. Yeah, okay. So it models people, places, devices using our persona system. It has a range of sensors, but the main ones are Bluetooth and system center. We also have login data, which is more useful for the um, undergraduate lab. So if I log in on an undergraduate lab, that can feed into evidence that I'm down there, which is just as well because nothing can be detected in some of those labs, none of the other sources. And we also have one of those Nike things that's rather cool that you can put in your Nike shoe or tie to the front of a non-Nike shoe and uh, we can also detect that. And mainly people carry Bluetooth enabled phones or maybe laptops and um, then we build up these models which I'll show you in a minute. But the two important ideas is we have two very, very simple ideas. We want things as simple as possible in our modelling of people so that we have some chance of explaining it to people. And if we are going to have stuff that's hard to explain, we want to be able to partition that off so people could say, well, I don't understand that. I don't want it to be operating on my stuff. So the two simple things are we do accretion. We just collect evidence as it comes in. And the whole idea of personas also is that you can control what evidence is allowed to go in your model. So you can decide what goes into your model. You can also choose where your model is kept. Um, so what machine it's kept on. And then we have this notion of resolution, which is a very simple idea that given the evidence, a resolver is a thing that interprets it and concludes a value. And the nice thing is that's where we can build privacy in as well because the resolution process can be tailored to who is going to get the information. So if I don't want someone to know very much, I will only allow them to access my model via resolver, which is fairly underprivileged. So I might, for example, well, we'll see what sorts of choices I have, but I might let some people know less about me than others. So here's an overview of the system and the way it works. Wasn't too sure of the audience and just what you wanted to know, but here we have the case of a Bluetooth phone, and it's, we're calling it BT Sensor 1. Obviously, everything has horrible, non-symbolic names down in the guts of the system, but just at the moment, we're going to assume everything's got somewhat symbolic names. They have symbolic names as well as the grungy ones. So there's a sensor which is this oval below the phone and it detects this phone. It then does a simple tell which is adding something to a model. In this case it's adding something to the model of that particular sensor. So that's all it has to know. The little machine that's sitting there with its Bluetooth sensor has just got to know how to get a message into in a as it happens in our case, a publish subscribed server, um, how to send a message that will do a tell which will get to its own sensor. Now, you can see up there that the sensor has got two things shown about it. One is its location. So when it was installed in that location, someone had to um, set it up and put in the place, the symbolic place 
that it has been put. So that sensor is in, shall we say, the lounge room. And then there is a part of the model, which we've been calling a component, which is seen, things it's seen. In this case, it says it's seen Bob's phone. Again, this is a symbolic name. And that line with tell on it is because that seen component, that part of the model has actually got a rule on it, that any time there's evidence added, the rules are evaluated, and it then does a tell to the model for Bob's phone. And that ends out with adding evidence to the model for Bob's phone saying that his location is currently the lounge room. And again, it's got one of these rules sitting on it. So once that changes, because we've now added something, and we're only showing a simplified view here, the lounge room, there was previous evidence put in there, but we're not showing it here. Um, it's able to say that the seen by value is also set to BT sensor 1. So there's a, a symmetry here between the sensor, which has a record of all the things it's seen, and the devices, which have a record of all the things they've seen by. So this is potentially important if you want to track down, if you get really paranoid, you want to know all the sources of stuff that's been kept about you. And at the bottom, we've got who is carrying the phone which again is something you do when you set it up. So if you lent your phone to someone, you ought to have a graceful way of changing that, though that's fraught. But, and if you're like me and you leave your phone <coughs> in your office, and it's usually not carried at all, um, well, then this system's really good for when I can't find my phone and I panic. <laughs> then I can actually find it with the system, but it's probably not so good for anyone to find me, except everybody knows that I leave my phone behind, so they they know how to interpret the evidence. But anyway, in general, and for Bob, whose model we're showing Bob's phone, Bob really does carry his phone, and so we're showing who's carried it. The whole point here, though, is that we've got a model of Bob's phone with stuff that's salient about it. And then we do the, because the location has that evidence changed, it triggers a rule to add the lounge room now to the location of Bob. And um, again, we've got this cemetery of carried by and carrying, which shows that Bob is carrying his phone and the phone is carried by Bob. I actually have some extra um, things to highlight that. The MAC address is actually in the system rather than a symbolic address. And this evidence was got in there by Bob telling the system. So this Bob said that he was carrying the phone. This is again pointing out there's a rule that fires. So there are some simple rules which we hopefully could explain to people, though we haven't done the evaluation of that part yet. And so it's showing that we're adding this evidence to Bob's phone model. And then this was the next rule that is going to update Bob's model. I hope that's simple enough. And uh, well, you might want to ask questions about that later. So we end up with pictures like this, again, anonymized. And you can see interesting things. And in, uh, in the discussions I had before lunch and over lunch, there um, was reference to things that we're certainly finding and also in a Ubicomp paper recently that sometimes some fairly low-grade information is enough for people to infer a lot. So here is me in my office because people who know me know that's my office. Now, the size of the dot shows how recent the data is. So this is showing that the evidence was a little bit old because there's a small dot. Um, no, well, if the phone was there, it would continue to be detected, so that would look like recent evidence. Assuming, of course, I've remembered to recharge it, which is another thing I'm not good at. Um, yes, I'm, I'm a difficult person when it comes to phones. But here are three people collaborating. And we know because we've asked people how they use things. Firstly, that's a way of people who know these people can decide, oh, well, they're working on that paper, so I'll leave them alone. Or they're people I know, and I want to have a cup of coffee. I'll go and ask if they want a cup of coffee, too, or whatever if I don't think they're working hard on something. So people are using this in quite subtle ways. And in fact, we've added something to the interface that each time people come to it, we ask them to tell us why they're using it, because we'd like to get a sense of that. And so we've been using it for quite a while. We had an earlier version in our previous building, but we've been in our new building since about the middle of last year. So after a fair period of use, we asked people to send us mail saying how they'd used this interface, because we were we realized, in fact, we've been inadvertently doing um, an interesting study of how people use location data, though initially it was 
built as a demonstrator of the personas representation stuff. And we analyzed that email and used that to write a questionnaire, which we then asked everybody to do. So we got a more consistent picture of what everybody said. And then we wanted to create a privacy control interface and then analyze what people did with that compared to the uses they want. Because suppose that when we had the system in use for the first year and everybody who signed up only did it on the understanding that everybody could see everything. And if people actually used it in certain ways, what if when there was privacy control those ways would be impossible? That was the sort of question we wanted to ask. And we also had only a fairly small group of people who had actually used the system, but also when we looked at the literature, most of the people who'd done work on privacy preferences had done it with people who were postulating what they would want. And so we wanted to see how a group of people who hadn't used the system but were actually potential subscribers, so they were fairly authentic, but hadn't used it. We wanted to compare their answers to this questionnaire. So first of all, the things people did when they used it. Probably nothing very deep, but firstly, some people did things checking where an individual was, often wanted to know the location of a person. Some people used it just to get a sense of where the group was or wanted to know where groups of people were. And some people used it to check their own data and how reliable it was. I had thought I was the only one bizarre enough to want to do this, but there were other people who said they did, so we put it in the questionnaire. And some people did. There was also a very clear different set of uses for social reasons, people to get together for coffee or just to have a chat or I've had enough of my thesis, I need to talk to someone or whatever. And at the other end of the scheme to do purely work-related things, deadline coming up for a paper and we're working on it few years together, I've got to talk to so-and-so or whatever. So the sorts of things that people mentioned, meetings, working on projects, short-term tasks and so on, especially with a timeline where you have to find people. And although I haven't put it on the slide, often to work out how the best way was to contact someone. So, for example, I've got a paper due at some hour like 4 a.m. in the morning, working up with my grad students, and I look, if they're in the lab, well, I'll ring them on their mobile, perhaps, or the lab phone. But if they're away from the lab phone, I'll ring them on their mobile. But if I see that they're at home, then I may not want to ring because it might disturb other people. I'll just send them email and take my chances. Or I send them email until I really panic that I haven't heard from them. Then I'll ring them at 2 a.m. in the morning, which is obviously not terrific either. What was quite striking was the variability of what people used it for. There was certainly no pattern. We couldn't say everybody did it for this. Everyone was different. But most of them only needed your recent location. They didn't need the historic stuff. And that's kind of good because people are more likely to be relaxed about that, but of course any time there's a system that lets people have anything, then people can set it up so they, they keep hitting the system to collect it continuously, and so in effect um, it doesn't give you a lot of privacy benefit in any way. This is the interface we built as our evaluation trial, and it's, well, it passed simple usability tests. I won't go through the gory details. It's, uh, you start off by picking your default resolver. We actually used our terminology. So all means it gives the location as determined by the system, including the timestamp. Here's an example. You're at your desk um, 10 minutes ago and or at David's home three hours ago. And this is the current value for you when you're using the system just to help you really understand what it means. So the, this test was actually done at that desk. Okay, so Hopefully people understand what these things mean. All is with everything we can do. Recent just means the same as all, but only using recent evidence. So if the best we've got is three hours old, we'll just say we don't know. We won't say where you were three hours ago. It's the main effect. Um, school of IT merely never reports your location unless it's inside the school building. Area is limited to the area we're in. Uh, work says it just says you're at work if you are. Otherwise, it says you're unknown. We Again, from the studies, we figured that was what people... given. The literature suggested some people want to lie, so this is your chance to consistently lie. Always gives a set answer, which is currently I'm busy, or whatever. Um, none of our people chose that. Uh, nothing, which one person chose, gives no information. And uh, so you could set it up with a default, and then you could nominate some people who differed from your default. 
So maybe the interface is not so gorgeous, but so you had to pick something on the left, and then you could, if you wished, pick a bunch of things on the right. This is the full table. I'll tell you the exciting bits. People chose, different people chose all of them. Uh, the only one they didn't pick was the fixed string, which maybe in actual use that might happen. This was just people sitting down. People did agonize a bit over it. There was a lot of chopping and changing by some people. 13 of our 24 users chose a single default strategy for everybody, which I think, you know, these are computer scientists and it's our building, so unfortunately that's what we're stuck with. But um, I suspect that would be very popular in the general public. Either you have to have a default or you won't do anything. Beyond that, quite a lot of the people, almost half, differentiated, and there were two options that people, I guess, could take and did take, which is to choose a default that was pretty restrictive and then have a list of people who were given more privileges, and then the opposite, which was um, a quite liberal default, and then some people, sorry, got this round the one, restrictive, with um, people given more generous, and the other is liberal, with some people more, more constrained, less generous. Um, I, for example, certainly opted for this highly restrictive one, and the reason was very simple. As it stood, I put nearly everybody onto the more generous list, but then I, I felt, well, I don't know who's going to join this system in the future, so just for the moment I'm going to say that my default is quite restricted, but then I can add more people as time goes on. So it's not terribly surprising. And half the people chose all or recent as the default. By and large, our particular population were happy with the choices, but that's not altogether surprising since they were the same population we used to survey initially on how they use the system and, and why they use it, and that was why we designed the interface as we did. The interface was understood, but then they were computer science people, small sample, and another weakness of the workers it was self-reports from memory about how people use the system. So we went to them after many months of use and said, please send us some mail about how you use the system and now do a survey on it. Well, they may not have remembered well. So we're now addressing that by quite a long, we've probably had six months of log data now of people when they come to it saying why they used it. Maybe we need a more general policy language and we're looking at stuff that might be understandable. There are a lot of directions to go. So I want to know quickly go to a quite, quite different project. Um, a second step. And this is looking at this idea that there's a huge amount of data about us, especially in learning environments, these what I call huge electronic traces, and we do almost nothing with them. You know, I have, we have a situation today where the grade three teacher knows nothing about what was happening in grade one, by and large, or if they do, it's very little. And yet there's so much data available. And um, I like this quote of Shakespeare, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. And it's certainly at least partly true if we actually had interesting models, we could see, you know, people who'd be like you to hear, this is where they went. Panic now, it's your chance. On the other hand, I actually think Shakespeare was overly generous because how self-aware are we? And I think that scrutable models have a real potential. And given how dumb the measures are at the moment that we're trying to explore, having, building something that you can use for your own purposes seems really promising. But we really need, unfortunately, for the issues of privacy, you need comparative models for meaning. So if I'm a student, or if you have a student in my class and they want to know how they're doing, well, okay, the fact that they've had a really detailed record and an overview of how they're going is interesting, but if they don't know how that compares with the class, it's not nearly as meaningful. And in fact, interestingly, in all the work we've done, the top students tend, when they assess themselves, to be much more brutal and assume they're doing much worse. And the corollary unfortunately holds too. The bottom end, at least in self-reports, um, tend to be generous with themselves, but then maybe the bottom students don't have the confidence to admit to the teacher what they don't know. I mean, if you can, why, why? Open yourself to that. So we have these things called wattle trees, and we have another project on educational data mining. I think both are kind of interesting, but I need to introduce track first of all. Um, audience participation, right hand up if you've know about track, left hand if you don't, both hands if you don't understand the question. Okay. Don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Right hand if you know, left hand if you don't. Okay. It was mainly left hands. 
Um, this is a technique I use in class. It's not as sophisticated as those little clicker things, but it seems to work all right. Okay, so it's, sorry to the people who know about it. Briefly, it's a tool, it's open source. It was developed for software development teams by software development teams. And a few parts that I will show you, there are lots of plugins and we're using several of them, but it has a wiki. You can understand that a team that's working for months or years on a project, a wiki is really handy for everybody to collaboratively edit web pages with information relevant for the team. Importantly, it also has a ticketing system, which is like the Bugzilla um, system, in, except the Bugzilla is obviously intended for bugs, for issue tracking. In track, the idea is each time there's a job to be done, whether it's fixing a bug that someone's identified or something that needs to be done for the project, you create a ticket, just like you do in some shops, you draw down a ticket to be served and when you're finished, you close the ticket. And then there's some quite nice interfaces to see them. And finally, it's got a very nice interface to SVN, a version control system. And um, I guess the real issue is that people developing software tend to use things like SVN for maintaining the software and for version control. And now I have to show you a picture of a wattle tree because it's the inspiration for what came next. It's Australian native and you're going to need some creativity to see the relationship between that and what you're going to see next. These are wattle trees. Um, this is an anonymized version of what we show our students. And this is what we call mirroring. So the idea of this project is that we've got all this data about people using track to manage their project. And it's, from their point of view, very hard to see what the big picture is. More importantly, if I'm in charge of a project as a team leader, or in my case as a teacher of a group that's trying to learn how to work as a group, it's very hard for me to see what's going on. So this takes a huge amount of data and visualizes it. And each of these lines with little uh, wattle flowers on it each one is one of my students. My students are depicted as beautiful wattle trees, if you have the imagination to see it. The time goes from the bottom to the top of the screen. Each day is one point at the moment. Dark green leaf means opening a ticket. So that person that the arrow, the line's pointing to, made four tickets at that point of time, opened some tickets. Team leaders tend to have that as a role. And the light green is when someone closes a ticket, presumably either finishing or declaring that they're not going to do it. It's quite a heavy cognitive load here to follow it. Yellow circles are contributions on the wiki. So each day we look at how much they did on the wiki and we make a circle that corresponds to the number of lines, a very dumb measure. And then, whoops. And then the orange dots are the corresponding measure for SVN. And you can see there are some people not doing a lot of SVN stuff because they're not using as it's intended to do, to be used, which is to be always committing to it and always keeping your current version rather than developing it on your machine and not putting it into the system. And uh, so that's pointed to something. Doesn't the, with the wiki necessarily correspond to code um, being written? Um, the actual code itself would go into SVN. Right, but the thing is you could... You could put a comment put in the wiki. Lots of comments in the wiki just for um, thinking, but actually doing the work and, and checking in the code would be a different task. Yes, they are different tasks, and the tickets are important too. There's often discussion on the ticket about the task and how to go about it and so on, because uh, there's a little wiki on each ticket as well. But SVN should be used as the place you're always putting your code into every few minutes when you're working, because you're not you can have a branch with your own stuff that's risky. You don't need to corrupt the working version. But the, the vision is that you really should be using SVN all the time. Yep. Are the multiple columns different teams or? Each column is one, each tree is one person in one team. Okay. So what we did is we built this so the team could see how they're going. And the way I use this is when I meet the team, I say, well, what am I seeing here? This person has done nothing on SVN. Should I be worried? You know, is the team decided that they're not writing code, they don't trust them to write code, um, or whatever. I mean, it's not my job to interpret it, because I'm an outsider. My job is to say, well, this can start a conversation. And as my slide will say afterwards, what excites me about this as someone who's taught teams for a very long time and had dysfunctional teams every year, 
since we've had this, we've been able to catch the dysfunctional teens early enough that we've been able to fix them. They haven't earned high distinctions, but they've deserved a pass as a team, which really excites me because it gets the bottom of the class up to a survival level. People suddenly become exposed, um, but also they, they are visible early enough that you can do something about it. So I find this very, very exciting from my point of view, and we've asked the students about their point of view. Now initially we designed all this to be agnostic to the particular tool that's using, because we did jointly with education and they were using a whole bunch of flash-based tools and we also <coughs> used some data in the public health um, school, which was based on WebCT discussions. And over time, education decided to go with track because the ticketing and the wiki are so nicely integrated that they decided they wanted that for their education, their uh, postgraduate education groups to collaboratively write essays. So that's pretty exciting. First of all, they don't use SVN. Um, but they certainly do their essays on the wiki and using tickets. So we're now ma making it much, much more track oriented. So here's a whole semester with one group. You can see the semester break dramatically. They took a week off. And you can see the deadlines, one here and well, there's one right at the end of the semester. <coughs> but I want to emphasize that we don't use this for assessment. It's used merely as a mirror for the group to use to help itself. And we have a very strong notion of training the leaders, the team leaders, on how to do their leadership role. And we use extreme programming. The two leadership roles are the manager and the tracker. And both of them really like this diagram because it really helps them see the big picture. You then have to drill down and find out what's actually going on. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it's a great start. And to me, this is very exciting as the sort of thing that we have the potential to do. Take all this data that no one could see and put it in a form that is useful. In our case, to save people from failing courses and to build up their confidence and so on. Here's a, <coughs> in the first year when we didn't actually make this available, but we produced it at the end of the semester, that was one of our weak groups. There is dramatic difference. Like maybe you go modify the wiki every day even. Yeah, the question was, do people change their behavior? Yes, they do. And there is the odd person who plays the system. But the course, in our case, is designed to be very sensitive to that. They are given a grade for individual performance about a third of the way through the semester. And one person in particular who was doing that got a failing grade the first time through because they were just putting stuff on. Um, and we found some improvement in that person's behavior. But again, we don't use it for assessment, right? So if they use it, then they're just fooling themselves. Uh, what has been much more common is students who in the survey said, I saw that diagram and suddenly I realized I was doing less than everyone else. Or it gave me a kick in the pants and I got my act together. And you can actually see quite dramatically an improvement in some of the weakest people. Uh, there have been a few people who've been doing much more than their share and they kind of worry me too because sometimes they don't let other people do stuff. They need some attention as well. So yes, it has changed behavior. Also, they've said, and so it looks, but I, I have to emphasize, these are very dumb measures. They're counting lines of code, and they're counting lines of contribution put on the wiki. So they're very dumb measures. OK. We also did an interaction graph for each medium, which looked at any two people who edited the same wiki page we said had interacted in some sense. And the thicker the line, the more interaction. And the real diagram has got people's names next to it, but we've cut them off to make it anonymized. What's really interesting about this one was that was supposedly the team leader. Now, that's got to worry you. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not for grading or, or punitive use. We really merely use it. Now, I realize in a workplace it'd be harder to convince people that the boss wasn't going to look at this. Um, but in our situation where we, ha we really are focusing on helping people learn, this is really important because it points to a problem. And if you can get in early and talk about what's going on here, you might be able to do something. It tripled the level of activity on average, and most of that was bringing the bottom up. Dysfunctional groups were identified and, in my point of view, saved. The managers, the people whose role was efficiently manager in the surveys, had a Likert scale one point higher than any other group for liking the wattle diagram and the interaction diagram. 
the trackers, the people whose job is you know, tracking whether things are being done and are on target, didn't care about interaction, which is reasonable. That wasn't their job, it was a manager's job. Uh, but they cared about Wattle. And the programmers, well, some of them weren't that keen on it at all. I thought it was a bit of a waste of time. So we've got to have to do a better sales job with them. OK, whoops, the data mining. I uh, don't have time to go into it in gory detail, but we've done some data mining, heaps of data mining to look for interesting patterns. And these, we did some clusters. We generated clusters which we vaguely characterized as a sort of a manager type behavior, a developer type behavior, a loafer type behavior. You know, there was not very much of anything. And then a, a majority, you know, we, those were the four clusters. We did the cluster generation automatically and then we looked at them and said what we thought they looked like. Some interesting things were, and these groups one to seven are in order of their overall final mark. Um, this group had no developers, and that certainly reflected top, sorry, the top was the best mark. Um, oh, sorry. Now I'm not sure, because this seems very odd, there are no developers. I think this is actually, no, this is what one might call random. Okay. <laughs> it's random, yes. Yes, I just realized, I, yeah. Okay, so this group had no people with a developer pattern, uh, which is interesting. Um, this group had no one with the manager pattern, which is also interesting. And it ma matched what we observed, which was that this group had um, a person, their manager was doing a great job and then got very sick and had to leave fairly early in the piece completely. And so then there was a bit of chaos. This group had three people with manager behavior, but they weren't the person designated as manager. And this, again, meshed with what we learnt by the end of the semester. So again, what we, oh, and this group had three people with loafer pattern. Again, the data is so lousy that you wouldn't dare use it for anything punitive. But if we'd had it earlier in the semester, we might have been able to go in and share it with people. And what we want to do is provide some data to people. Step three, something completely different and matching some discussions that I had with people. Our keep in touch interface, and the idea of this is really simple. The funding was to help elderly people keep in touch with their grandchildren. But I'm going to demo it in the context of a family which has uh, dad, mum, and small child. Mum can log in by touching her photo on a touch screen, and she sees these people she keeps in touch with, grandpa, child and husband. So some people living in the same house, grandpa lives somewhere else. So we wanted this very, very simple to use. Someone who perhaps was cognitively impaired and elderly and maybe can't even use a phone anymore would simply have to know how to touch a picture. The login screen that I showed you first is not needed. If you live in a house on your own, you go straight to this screen. Okay, so each of the little envelopes is a message. The red ones are ones you haven't listened to and the yellow and the gray indicate how recent they are. The gray is a little older. And now you can touch the child's photo and you start talking. The screen looks like this. When you've finished and you're happy with it, you just touch the tick and off it goes. And that's all there is to it. To listen to a message, you just touch the message and it plays. And to get rid of a message, you rub it out by rubbing across like this. That's all the functionality in the basic system. You can also plug in a phone. Sorry, you can plug in a camera, digital camera, because we thought that might be useful for children. And um, when you hit the record button, the pictures that you've loaded appear at the bottom. So that when you're at this point, when you're talking, underneath all the photos, there is um, a whole pile of the photos from the camera. And you can touch one of those, and it gets sent with the audio message. Actually, interestingly, we thought that was important to include because it would stimulate children to talk about activities during the day or whatever. Um, in fact, using the system myself, it actually puts a bit of cognitive load on you because you're trying to think about what you're going to say and even touching the picture puts you off. But um, it's still pretty easy to use. And so the first vision was to use it to help people keep in touch, especially across time zones. If you've got someone living in the UK and someone living in Australia, or wherever, it's often hard to keep in touch, often hard to make a phone call. Email's totally inappropriate for these populations because children are pre-literate. Grandparents today, many of them are not comfortable with email, but if they're 
suffering cognitive loss, obviously, um, something really simple is important. But we also wanted to lower the threshold of effort. We call it an appliance. We vis visage that it would get very cheap. It would be in your kitchen. So you think of grandma and you just touch it and send her a message. And hopefully she realises you think of her often. We had actually thought that um, this would put a great burden on people, you know. Grandma rings and says, now listen, haven't heard from you. You couldn't put your finger on the wall and send me a little message. Um, and we've actually been putting it in some houses and seeing how it's used in practice. And we need to get some more data before we can report that. But linking it to this lifelong vision, although this is an appliance, I think that there are some interesting things that are part of this lifelong user model and data collection. And that is that the patterns may support reflection on the level of interaction. How often did I intend to talk to grandma? And how often did I do it? Many of us are not good at assessing how often we do things. Um, the patterns of use and interaction may have diagnostic value. You know, there's something going wrong in our family. People aren't talking to each other. In fact, uh, on the way over to lunch, there was a mention that old people who stop interacting are um, often on the way down, um, having problems. So again, this might be a pointer. If you get very long-term trends that grandma's interacting less often, that might have diagnostic value. We also know that the little children who came into our lab to trial it listened to the messages over and over and over and over. Um, and in the interviews we did with the families, there was a suggestion that these long-term things might be quite valued. So, you know, in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, you might like to hear your two-year-old excitedly talking about their birthday to grandma or whatever. So there are some quite interesting things in terms of the lifelong models. Fourth step of four is um, tabletops. And I actually am immensely grateful to Microsoft because we've been doing this work now for three and a bit years and um, we had trouble taking getting people to take it seriously. They'd come and see our demos, and I'm going to show you some, and they'd say, oh, you know, that's not going to go anywhere. Who'd want that? But once the surface publicity went out, all that changed. Now, this again was funded for elderly people. The idea was that we wanted to support reminiscence, and this is a video of some of the elderly people who um, generously agreed to be participants in our evaluation study. And this is in a loop if it looks repetitively. <laughs> it's a very short loop. and the original vision was to help them reminisce. Lots of reasons why that's a really good idea. And partly, and the direction it's going now, is that it is natural to sit around a table after you've been on a holiday or you had an exciting day and to talk to the people in your family or whatever about that experience. And if you had pictures, you could easily show them and circle, you know, make bigger so you could talk and send people copies of their own and so on. That would be rather nice. So uh, we evaluated it and uh, then we moved on to make it rather more feature rich. So this is actually in our lab with a, you'll have to trust me, that's a 3D wall. And um, if you throw the picture to the edge of the table, it, it goes up onto the wall. Obviously throwing it in other directions could potentially have other functions. And what you're going to see in a moment is some of the features. The blue translucent thing is what we call the frame and he just used that to rest over part of the picture and dwell and that took a screen grab of what was under it. What you're seeing now is what we call the live image and I have to say our choice of names is never going to win us any prizes. So this is actually interacting with Google Maps and uh, the hand you see is Trent Apted, the PhD student whose work this is and he's using this for a reminiscence interface so he's homing in into, as it happens, Sydney Airport. And you'll see he'll demo how you do these screen grabs and some writing, just the moment he's interacting. It's a bit sluggish because of the connection to the, the machine running the browser. And he's just moving around, finding just the place he wants. You'll see that he's using a pen. The previous picture of the old people was a diamond touch, which you interact with your fingers. And this is using Mimeo whiteboard technology. We hope we're hardware agnostic, and we hope we're operating system agnostic. It runs certainly on three major software platforms or machines, um, and lots of machines. So he's homing in. He's just There was a click then, which you would have heard if I'd plugged in the audio. And so he's just 
getting it. There are, I have other videos which I can show you more detail. But the vision is you come in and you talk about things, you show people things on the map, you talk about pictures, and we just grab the audio and it's a serendipitous capture of your experiences. We then segment it and make a web page with each of the pictures and the stories you told around it, but maybe for lifelong, long term, you may want to come back to them. If only because today when I tell you a story about a trip I took a week ago, I can tell you excruciatingly boring detail about every place and so on. And in a year's time, I'll have forgotten it all. And so if I want to come back and bore people in a year's time, I'm going to have to go back to the old video or the old audio, more to the point. This work has now moved into work of Anthony Collins, which I'll show you. He's again showing you moving some images around. And here what we're doing is exploring the situation where two people come together and they've got to do something collaboratively. And they've been using, he just clicked and that now will do an associative search on the image that he just clicked on. Two people have got their own laptops and they've been collecting information for a joint task. And we now want to have a file system view across these two laptops. And whilst I may know the hierarchy on mine, I neither know nor want to know the hierarchy on someone else's. So it makes sense to have an associative search. So here he is, that's the email that was telling them what they had to do and he rested on it. This is a history which shows you the history of the searches you've done so you can go back to them. And in a moment he'll, that blue one with the arrows takes you back to your start position. And we think this is kind of exciting because if you're going to have this sort of interaction, file system interaction, so to speak, is a, a primitive function of an operating system. And once you've got multiple people collaborating on a surface, you really need to rethink the way all that works. And interestingly, in our evaluations where we had one hierarchical browser view available, each person saw their own hierarchy, they collaborated, collaborated much less than when they had this interface where anyone could search on anyone's files. You know, I could see your files. Oh, yes, I want that. I'm going to do the search on it. And there was more collaboration, which is kind of interesting. That's early work, but we're pretty excited by it. shared history. Um, well, if we go back to the icon up there, the, that's got a clock icon, there is history there, but the search is just purely associative. It can take into account time. It would be a whole talk to go through the gory detail. I'm happy to answer questions on it. So just to sum up a little over time, the electronic traces that are all through our environment and data and my interaction, um, all are available here and in this case we want to create these serendipitous artifacts of the stories that were told around pictures. Potentially use all of this stuff for reflection, monitoring and planning, that's the vision of lifelong modelling, and also for health, social and physical well-being certainly for learning where reflection is important and very quickly there's a whole toolkit we've got in layers and I've only talked about some bits so this could have been worse I could have gone on much longer I won't go through the issues because there are lots of them and just there are a whole bunch of people who help do this stuff and I'd be happy to have some time for questions issue when you talk about reflections because um, as a science student way back when um, there was a distinct difference between recognition versus recall and I, I think I remembered that most of the memory studies um, supported recall being able to do recall as being a much stronger way to reinforce learning but most of our technologies um, except search, of course, um, is, is recall, but what you're talking about seems to be more of associated with recognition as a way of doing, of um, keeping a person uh, knowing things. Okay, well I abstract, I glossed over the fact that what we choose to collect as data about people is obviously a pretty important decision on collecting stuff that's worth showing them. And I've also glossed over how easy it is to build bad interfaces that don't do any good. 
or maybe how hard it is to build really good ones. But I think that the answer is actually at a slightly different level. I think that the issue is that we're busy in the small details of our life living day to day or interacting in this minute with this person and to see the big picture is hard and that's what we're trying, well what I'm very keen to do, to be able to present the data to people in a way that they can actually see what's going on because at the moment we mainly have, if we do have access to the data we have it, you know, minute iota by iota and we're drowned in the detail, first of all. and Secondly, um, we may not even have access to the data because we aren't actually building our system so that that data is available. I mean, the web pages I visited and what's happening when I access other people's websites, the data sets that people keep about me, they're not available. Um, so I think that, well, there are a lot of issues, but at the moment we're not even letting people see the stuff that's very simple that lets them answer really simple questions like, you know, how am I going in this group? And I also think the issue of how I'm going relative to other people. Um, I've got some other ones on how people are going in a course on user interface design where we basically, things they're doing well in go green and things they're doing badly in go red. So that you can just get a sense. I mean, learners often in a course have no idea really where they are or even what the teacher wants them to know. And so some of this is about communication, say, between a teacher and a learner in that context. Some of it's just having a way to be able to see the data. You then need, I think, to scrutinise, to dig down and find out what, what it all means. The wattle trees, for example, which hopefully are very evocative and, and memorable as an image, even if the exact meaning is not, um, we need to be able to drill down from that to see more and to work out how we're going. I actually think that First, though, we've got some really low-hanging fruit here. There's all this data that none of us gets any benefit of in terms of reflecting on how we're going and working out what our priorities are, what we should do more of, what we need to do less of. Um, you know, are we doing enough of something? Am I going okay in my learning? Heaps and heaps of things. We could get, even from dumb data, a better sense of how we're doing. I agree with you that after that, how to use the reflection and how, how people... There's literature that says that good learners are reflective, which kind of intuitively can be summarised into the fact that if I've made a mistake and I stop and think about it and plan to do better next time, I might do better than the person who just goes on and doesn't reflect at all. I mean, it's an overstatement of it. It's not clear that people who don't reflect normally are going to bother to reflect with these interfaces, but if we can help people a little, I think there is a lot to be achieved. So since we've done so little at the moment, just being able to make the data available in some form that you can get sort of the classic overview visualisation then drill down to the details. I think we've got a long way to go. So you probably, well certainly any psych theories on how to help people actually engage are very important. In the case of our wattle trees, I as a teacher engage with the, well actually I just engage with the managers because it's their job to then take it to the group and report back to me and that's what I want them to learn as their role of manager. Um, so how to use it in practice to get results, that's also really interesting. I don't know if I've answered your question. Well, yeah. <laughs> how much uh, do you worry about individual variation in the implicit data that you collect? So this, this sort of goes back again to... Okay, so the question was how, how do, much do we worry about individual variation? Well, at the moment, not a lot. Um, but we've been thinking about it in a number of contexts. So for example, in the wattle trees, which is the easiest to describe, we want the students to start running that interactively and making the group contract map onto it. So it says, so that people essentially make a deal with themselves on what their wattle tree should look like, well, I, I, I if that makes sense. But also when it comes to the location modelling, my location not model probably needs to model that I A, forget to recharge my phone, B, leave it behind, um, I guess that's the bad things about the phone. Um, I'm mainly the only person who uses my computer, but there'd be other people who certainly would have other people just come up and use their computer and so on. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, or if you imagine, what if you're a very efficient coder? And it, it, it's sort of, so you're collecting implicit data. Yeah. And you all these uh, okay, I see what you mean. Right, or, you know, I'm a mother, so I work 
shorter hours, but they're very high Okay, well that's, hours, that's very fair. Okay, so there are, in extreme programming there are certain roles and in general some people and in a good team you put together you don't hire everyone with the same skill set, obviously. Um, so not everybody needs to be writing code. That's why I don't make any statements about what these diagrams should look like. I merely ask, what am I seeing here? And I've got a list of what people's official roles are. <laughs> and so I, I have a sense that, you know, if this person's officially the manager, they, they should look as though they certainly should be putting stuff on the wiki because otherwise, you know, they're not communicating things. Um, they should be doing a lot of interacting in the interaction diagram because we actually tell them about, um, we use what's called a big five theory of group work and it talks about three step process of communication. If I ask you a question and you give me an answer, I should have a third, well firstly you should give me an answer. Second step, and the third step is I should let you know whether that was what I, whether you've succeeded and you know, we've, we're now finished. It may go on further, but it should be at least three step. And we tell the students that if you read the minutes, on the wiki and you don't put a message saying, you know, I'm happy with these, um, you're not letting, doing the communication and if the group manager doesn't go in there and see that everybody's put it up and say, well, good, I'm glad everyone likes it or, oh, you know, if they didn't like something, doing something about it, then that three-step process isn't being carried out. So there are some things that we can, again, just say, well, this is what we believe this might be pointing to. You work it out because this is for you to improve your group management. Um, in, with regards to the first example of the location tracking, did you have um, rules for conflict resolution? Um, you did show the previous one and a current one in the, in the sign up, I guess. Okay, so the, the question was, do we have different rules for interpreting the evidence about a person? And the answer is yes. We call that the resolver process. And resolvers are very tiny programs that interpret as much evidence as they're allowed to see. And you can tie one to certain people. So I could say, this resolver can only see evidence I've explicitly put into the system. It's not allowed to use any evidence. It's blind to any evidence that's been observed about me. So it can't see any of the Bluetooth evidence. It can't see anything, whatever. And I associate that with certain people and certain applications. So they have very poor data about me, but at least I feel on top of it. So you can easily do that. Um, so we have a whole bunch of resolvers, uh, the most sophisticated of which uses an ontology of the building to try and resolve conflict. Because, for example, there are Bluetooth sensors on one floor that detect people on both floors. So the uh, ontology knows that you can't be on levels two and three at the same time. <laughs> Um, and it, it has a whole bunch of things it does to try and deal with it. It has to dig further back in the data and so on. So that's for a slightly different reason. And we're exploring that space, but certainly yes. And again, that would be where I could potentially have one for me that said my phone's a bit um, inclined to have false positives if I leave it behind, false negatives if I forget to recharge it. Um, yeah. <laughs>